so good morning. We have a session on uh, uh, Squint Simplified. I would like to invite uh, Chairperson uh, Dr. Virendra Sajdeva, uh, Co-Chairperson Dr. Satya, uh, myself Dr. Rushikesh the Convener, uh, Dr. Vivekanan, Dr. Vivek, and Dr. Snehal Ganatra. Okay, so. Uh, thank you, Rishikesh. Uh, we welcome you all to this session on uh, Strabismus S Simplified. I think we'll shift gears. And uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Rohit, and uh, who is more experienced than him here. Dr. Rohit, please come on the dais. Thank you. <laughs> they are leftovers from your talk. <laughs> So you glued them <laughs> and we'll continue the glue. <laughs> so uh, let, let's hope that we will have a wonderful session. All of you can come forward if you want to and uh, we'll, uh, we'll begin with the interesting session. Uh, Dr. Amar Pujari is not there, right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Amar Pujari, is he here? No. no. Mm -hmm. Dr. Deepti? No. Okay. So, in that case, uh, I think we would begin with a very important talk uh, on a concomitant exotropia and Dr. Rishikesh, uh, uh, our convener for the session will be speaking about it, improving alignment outcomes following surgery for committant exotropia. So, I think we all see exotropia commonly and we all operate, uh, it's very easy. But uh, at the same time, improving okay. outcomes, especially over long term, is something which is a challenge for all the strepismologists. Dr. Rishikesh will be addressing it. Over to you. Uh, good morning. And uh, I was not mentally prepared for the first talk, actually, because it was third. So, uh, uh, just a sec. Uh, so I'll be presenting. Uh, uh, why exotropia surgery? Actually, for almost all uh, strabismologists, uh, exotropia is the commonest uh, uh, strabismus entity which everybody encounters in his uh, uh, practice. Uh, but in spite of the best hands and best experience, nobody can be doubly sure that the outcome will be good. Uh, even if the long, uh, I mean the immediate outcome will be bad, okay, but the long term outcome nobody can be uh, doubly sure about it. So, uh, I would like to thank the scientific committee AOS for uh, giving me an opportunity to be a part of this uh, August gathering for uh, of strabismologist. So, uh, next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll start with uh, uh, two sets of cases. Um, uh, I mean, they were similar cases uh, uh, with uh, uh, almost the same uh, angles of deviation and a similar surgical dose was done, but the outcome was different. Now, this is a 20-year-old female who presented with outward deviation uh, since eight years. Uh, she had around 60 uh, prism diopters of exotropia. Uh, she had right eye separation, though you see more on the left eye as a squint, but she had right eye separation, no refractive error, and the vision was good. So, uh, we decided decided to do a three muscle surgery, uh, lateral rectus, bilateral resection with the uh, right medial rectus resection. Uh, unfortunately, after the immediate post-operative period itself, she had a residual of around 25 prism diopters. So, uh, the patient was dissatisfied. I actually advised uh, ex re-exploration or re-surgery for her, but I think uh, she came back to me after three months because I think she must have taken opinion here and there ultimately. Uh, but uh, then she was mentally prepared for surgery. We had option of either uh, exploring the medial rectus in the right eye which we had already uh, resected or go for the virgin muscle which was the left eye medial rectus. Uh, we decide, uh, I mean I usually prefer the, the muscle which has not been touched to get, uh, because uh, the result will be much more predictable. So it was after the second uh, surgery that we got uh, a good alignment. Uh, similar case, similar age group but this time a male who had uh, angle of around 60 prism diopters, good vision, no refractive error and again we did a, a three muscle surgery in his uh, case low, uh, with left eye medial rectus resection section and we got a good uh, outcome. In fact, he had around five prism diopters of risk, uh, over correction also which we usually aim for in these cases. So, uh, now the other set of patients, uh, a 25 year old male, uh, again he had a good vision, no refractive error and a constant squint in the uh, right eye. So, 
we decided to do he wanted to do surgery only on one eye so we did a recess reset uh, but in spite of two muscle surgery uh, i had a residual of around 20 prism diopters in this case so uh, somehow i was able to convince the patient and we decided to go for uh, the second eye surgery again we did two muscles and uh, to get a, a good alignment a similar age group patient uh, this time uh, uh, he was a 24-year-old male with around same deviation, around 40 prism diopters, uh, with good vision, no refractive error. And uh, we did almost the same amount of surgery, but this time we got a better alignment, though he uh, developed inferior oblique overaction later on. Uh, so uh, it turned out to be a V pattern afterwards. So uh, and, uh, this was one patient whom we had, uh, he had uh, some amount of nystag nystagmus also, which resulted in left face turn. We did two muscles, uh, three muscle surgery, and not only that, we got a good alignment, but also uh, his uh, face turn got corrected. I did a, a middle rectus resection also in his case in the left eye. Uh, not only that, the patient might be dissatisfied with the alignment, but sometimes even if the alignment is good, uh, the patient might be dissatisfied with the eye looking small if you do a unilateral recess resect. Uh, no, th uh, or always uh, look for other uh, causes of pseudo exotropia like uh, uh, telecanthus in this case. Uh, so even if you get a good alignment, the patient might be dissatisfied. You need to tell this beforehand to the patient. So coming to preoperative planning for exotropia, uh, preoperative evaluation includes a complete history, visual uh, status and cyclopelagic refraction. Do a detailed sensory and motor evaluation, especially uh, rule out any uh, suppression, unilateral suppression or lateral incommittance. I will come to that point later on. But we need to do that and also try to explore non-surgical options if they are possible like orthoptic exercises and prisms uh, though there are uh, algorithms for uh, uh, surgery like one millimeter in uh, will correct around this much amount of prism diopters but create your own algorithm uh, because it differs from surgeon to surgeon uh, some preoperative tips for exotropia surgery remember that a large deviation gets more correction per millimeter compared to a small angle deviation uh, also patient with fusional potential uh, should be over corrected that's why you need to measure i mean look for fusional potential because uh, an adult who has a less fusional potential will look better with a small angle exo compared to over, over corrected exo uh, also remember that constancy is more and uh, constancy or intermittency decides whether we need to operate instead of the angle of deviation like if the angle is around 25 prism diopter of constant squint it's better to operate compared to ids who is uh, uh, i mean has a large angle but uh, lesser frequency of the squint uh, more uh, effect of squint surgery is produced in smaller eyes compared to larger eyes in children compared to adults also recent squint uh, the compared to a long-standing squint, uh, large deviation as I have already mentioned. And if there is lateral incommittance, we need to reduce the dose of surgery. Uh, also, uh, if the patient is on orthoptic exercises, the amount of deviation, uh, I mean, which you get uh, for per millimeter is much more. I mean, amount of correction which we get is much more. Uh, this differs from surgeon to surgeon, but generally up to 15 prism diopter of exo can be corrected with a single muscle surgery, usually. Uh, if it is, uh, I mean, you do bilateral recession of 5 millimeter, it is able to correct around 25 uh, prism diopters. Uh, so anything beyond 20 prism diopters, take two muscles into consideration. Uh, you, the same do, uh, applies for bilateral recession, uh, uh, for medial resection. Again, you have already done a recession and you have not got a desired result. A recess reset of 5 millimeters will also produce around 25 prism diopters, though this varies actually. Uh, remember that anything beyond 45 prism diopter of exo, it is better to do a 3 muscle surgery. And anything beyond 75 prism diopters, you need to go for 4 muscle. I usually don't do 4 muscle in one sitting. I usually keep 1 muscle later on. Uh, there are different kinds of squint which also determine the uh, uh, kind of surgery which we do. B basic type, when the deviation for distance and near is same, you do a unilateral recess reset or a bilateral recession which I prefer. Uh, divergence or pseudo divergence excess, we go for bilateral recession. One important point is, if there is a basic exotropia, don't do only bimedial recession, uh, resection. Always do re uh, lateral rectus recession. That only will give you a desired result. So, uh, whether to aim for overcorrection or not, there is a deep, that's also a debatable topic. There are few clinicians who feel that you can keep orthophoria. Uh, I think my time is over. I will just uh, uh, go, uh, go for the take home uh, points. Uh, careful preoperative evaluation and surgical planning is uh, important before we take uh, uh, a patient for surgery. Uh, counseling and more chair time is required uh, so that we can set realistic goals for the patient. Always pound, uh, point out the pseudo exotropia if that is present and create your own algorithm. And if you get a suboptimal result, uh, don't go in a denial mode. Accept it 
and uh, explain the patient that a second surgery if re required can be undertaken early. These are the references for my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Vishikesh. That was wonderful and uh, the examples were very nice. So I think some very important, we will take two minutes for discussion yes. and then uh, later on we can see uh, how much time we have. Some very important questions I think that everybody would have in mind uh, while planning exotropia is what all to do in the pre-op evaluation. You highlighted doing the complete sensory evaluation also. Uh, over there I, I want to stress that many a times when the squint is long, sc long standing and the patient is coming to us quite late, they might have already developed the ARC. So, planning for the correct angle according to subjective angle also matters. Uh, you also mentioned about lateral incompetence in the motor evaluation. You want to stress it now? Uh, yeah, lateral incompetence actually, uh, I mean, though we call it as a committent exotropia, there might be some amount of lateral incompetence. That is, we tend to measure in uh, the lateral gazes or all positions of gaze. And if the deviation is less uh, by 10 prism diopters in lateral gazes compared to primary gaze, we need to under, uh, I mean, reduce the dose of the surgery which we have, we might have planned otherwise. Otherwise, the patient will go into an overcorrection. So, yeah. So, measure like even primary gaze is 50 and in the lateral gaze it is 40, you plan for the undercorrection under in those cases to avoid diplopia. Uh, you also were mentioning that one muscle surgery can correct up to 20 PD, right? Maximum. You. Uh, that was there. I think most of the people after 25 will operate on two muscles. Uh, yeah. And uh, more than 50, I think uh, everybody is shifting to three muscles at least in the first sitting. So these are some of the considerations. And uh, maybe recess resect versus bilateral recessions again is debatable, but everybody can titrate according to the type of the strabismus. I think that is important. Dr. Rohit, you would like to add a few points? Uh, just wanted to say that uh, um, uh, overcorrections was discussed. So, uh, intermittent divergent squints are actually the toughest to manage. That's what we feel now and as he's mentioned, it's increasingly, we're seeing far more exotropias than esotropias. Twenty years earlier, we were seeing more esos than exos and I think maybe uh, myopization and progressive change we are seeing a much more uh, prevalence of exotropias among the population than esotropias. Uh, overcorrection is generally what we follow now is that in an older patient, we do a slight overcorrection of about 5 to 10 prisms to catch the exo drift that these patients would have. Uh, over time, they are going to go back to a slight recurrence of the exo. So we slightly overcorrect then usually that diplopia that they may have in the initial period is advantageous because it helps to stimulate binocularity because the intermittent divergent squints particularly have a functional central scotoma which we need to stimulate. So that's the advantage of overcorrection but we need to be very careful in children. So less than seven years or eight years where there is a little higher risk of them developing amblyopia or monofixation syndromes we tend not to overcorrect, we would tend to optimally correct. So, these are, you know, essentially the tips I, I, I would say, yes. Yeah, so I think what uh, he has shown, you know, quite interesting cases. Sometimes we do have this uh, weird uh, outcome despite we plan, you know, the normal, you know, so-called, you know, the surgical nomograms for that particular amount of deviation. But I think, you know, you need to have different parameters like what is the age of patient, how long the strabismus, what is the vision, what is the refractive error and you know what is the sensory status. So, and then the most important thing is on table how's you know the muscles, the muscle like tone, yeah. force duction test that is very very important. So that gives you considering all these parameters along with FDT helps you to change you know, you know alter your doges on table and table to up. have a you know so called precise outcome. Yeah. I completely agree with Dr. Rohit that, you know, in children's with intermittent XT, it is always plan or target to have, you know, the straight gaze, primary gaze alignment rather than overcorrection. You can choose that option, you know, in a little bit elder, you know, the patients or, you know, the elder kids where there is always a risk of, you know, the uh, amblyopia or monofixation syndrome. So, and in my practice, uh, I have almost stopped, you know, doing three muscles or four muscles since uh, we have come up with, you know, the muscle transplantation. 
so they do have a very good uh, uh, outcomes and you know the palpable fissure narrowing mm -hmm. and lateral incomitance they are completely get uh, you know omitted if you choose to do the muscle transplantation uh, actually there was, there was one talk on plication so i did not cover that part uh, that's why i mentioned more of resection actually that's why thank you thank you okay so in the interest of time we'll move ahead with the next talk uh, we have with us Dr. Rohit Saxena. Uh, he actually doesn't need any formal introduction. He's so well known to all of us. Uh, but just uh, to complete formality, he's a very well known national international figure, uh, professor of ophthalmology at RP Center Ames. And it's a pleasure for all of us to have you. He'll be speaking to us on the management of third nerve palsy, a tough scenario. Uh, thank you, Virendra. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, AIOS and Andhra Pradesh Ophthalmolog Ophthalmological Society, for the option uh, for the opportunity to present here. I'll just talk, uh, give you a brief overview of managing third nerves, which can be quite a challenge, uh, and I have no financial interests, unfortunately or otherwise, to disclose. Uh, complete third nerve palsy can be quite a challenge, and uh, it's uh, because essentially four of the six muscles rotating the eye are affected. But still, uh, over the past few years, we've had some increasing options being developed. Among them, of course, we know the maximal or supramaximal recess resect procedures of the ipsilateral, uh, that is the involved or the other eye, the lateral rectus periosteal fixation with a large medial rectus recession, uh, a medial globe anchor of, uh, along with a large lateral rectus recession, uh, and of course, medial transposition of the lateral rectus, which is now a fairly popular and world over practice in surgery. So, uh, incomplete third nerve palsy, where you have some eye function of the medial rectus. So, wherever there is some adduction that you see, the eye is crossing the midline, you know that there is some function to the medial rectus. We'll plan for an ipsilateral supramaximal recess resect procedure. Remember, we are talking supramaximal, that is more than our conventional comitant surgery uh, decision making. So, the limits that we discuss for comitant surgery would not be applicable here. We are talking about an incomitant squint, so we are not worried about incomitants because we know that will exist. In a comitant strip, Christmas, we have limits because we don't want to create incompetence and have a patient complain of diplopia, say, in the lateral gazes. That is why we have those limits that we have. So, ipsilateral recess resect procedures will give you fairly good correction in the primary gaze, would also help you to retain the motility that you have uh, and be good for it. The other option is sometimes uh, in partially recovered uh, third nerve palsies, you have some element of aberrant innovation like the medial rectus fibers getting misdirected or going to the uh, LPS. So you have on attempted adduction a bit of lid retraction. Now, uh, this can be used if the patient is willing. When you operate the other eye, you create what is a fixation duress and based on that, along with the primary gaze correction, like in this case, it was a right third nerve palsy with an aberrant innervation. We operated the supramaximal recess resect procedure in the left eye and we got the correction of the deviation along with the correction of the ptosis. So, the aberrant innervation can be used. Remember, when you are operating the other eye, you need to do as much amount of surgery in the normal eye as you would have planned for the affected eye because the angles or the, inter the muscles are abnormal and that's what you need an additional innervation to get that alignment. So, in incomplete third nerve palsies, you have these options available for you. However, when you have complete third nerve palsies, the challenge becomes much more because you have only essentially two functional muscles to look at the lateral rectus and the superior oblique. A lot of people have tried the superior oblique uh, transposition to the medial rectus. Unfortunately, our results have not been too good. We do get some abnormal features and because the muscle still does not learn that it is supposed to work like the medial rectus, so the superior oblique works like the way it should and we have abnormal eye movements. So, among the other options would be to do a lateral rectus anchoring to the periosteum of the lateral orbital wall. So, the large abducting force of the lateral rectus is removed from the equation and then you can do a medial rectus resection and get some degree of alignment. Now, this is useful with poor but not absolutely absent medial rectus function. So, in this case you can see that the eye in adduction does move to a small extent. So, the eye is moving here to in, in adduction but it is not a it is not crossing the midline. So, in this case we did the lateral rectus uh, periosteal fixation with a large medial rectus resection. You could get a fair amount of primary gaze alignment. So, horizontally the eye was corrected. 
unfortunately if you see a patient like in this patient there was no medial rectus function so in a case with very poor or nil medial rectus function trying this can be disappointing because the medial rectus has no function at all so it's just like tightening a rope and over time it just extends and goes back and therefore you will be back to the residual exotropia the other options are the globe fixation procedures on the medial side there are a lot of globe fixation procedures that have been described and i generally prefer to use the pre crankler approach because this gives us a very fast rapid entry the other advantage of globe fixation procedures are that you haven't actually done operated in any muscle of course we combine it with a lateral rectus recession so you've just done one lateral rectus recession which is essentially necessary in a third nerve palsy management and done the medial anchor so you've actually not change the vascularity of the medial rectus so this is the approach which i use the pre crankler the moment you open the pre crankler approach you manage you just get to the medial periosteal wall and from there you you tie uh, non absorbable ethibond sutures that what we use we bring out these sutures from adjacent to the medial rectus and we just tie them right next to the medial rectus so this is uh, one of the patients uh which we had operated and you can see very good primary gaze alignment obviously there is not enough motility so you don't get too much motility with this the new kid on the block is something which now world over is being talked about is the lateral trans lateral rectus transposition to the medial side or the nslrt and again this has been fairly old in description but recent in revisiting and a lot of discussion has gone on uh, dr goki git from turkey and uh had actually revisited it and talked about it and essentially there was this uh, uh shortcoming that procedure that it left a little bit of residual so we modified it and we started while transposing the split lateral rectus to both sides of the medial rectus we added a posterior fixation suture which gave us a lot of uh, very successful results the important thing that you can see in this ct is that you need to split the lateral rectus far back almost 18 20 mm far back so that it comfortably wraps around the behind of the globe and does not cause compression there and causing edema so this is one of the patients of the uh, surgery i do a posterior tenac to me of the superior oblique along with this because it not only helps in removing the ab ducting force but also allows for movement of the superior split end of the lateral rectus underneath again another patient gives very good long term outcomes in this uh, when you have vertical deviation along with a large horizontal you can actually transpose the whole muscle from the opposite side so in this there was hypertrophia so uh, so the entire lateral rectus was shifted from inferiorly that is inferior Uh, underneath the inferior oblique inferior rectus to the medial rectus again brought great vertical and fairly good horizontal correction uh, i'll just take a couple of more slides just images actually this is again a child with hypotropia the exotropia we transpose the lateral rectus from the superior root again you can see a good correction of the vertical deviation because these were fixed transpositions we look to try and make them adjustable this Uh, uh the two splits were crossed over from underneath the medial rectus so this was the inferior slip being sutured superiorly and the superior slip being sutured inferiorly on an adjustable so i used the short tag news to make them adjustable and again they this gives you great correction and you can also titrate a little bit of residual hyper or hypo again another child with mild vertical you can see in the preoperatively position where uh, it was adjusted uh, intraoperatively and corrected so essentially summarizing we have increasing options see whether it's complete or incomplete how much there is function of the medial rectus is there any aberrant regeneration is of course the patient willing for the other eye surgery which can be a challenge choose the appropriate surgery we can see that there is a graded response to various kinds of surgeries i use uh, lateral rectus to medial side especially in associated vertical deviations the medial periosteal fixation is like a fail safe surgery for me so i have done it in probably all kinds of residual uh, surgeries including uh, uh, lateral rectus to medial rectus failed uh, lr to mr transpositions if the fdt is tight and uh, you have large residuals so thank you very much for the opportunity yeah wonderful talk dr rohit i, I think uh, when the problem becomes big you have to plan powerful procedures so uh, uh, very well highlighted all the surgeries and i think preoperative counseling is very very important for planning surgery on the other eye or planning multiple procedures that these might be needed vivek you want to add anything yes yeah, so i think uh, wonderful uh, you know the
panorama of different surgical procedures and that too you know for third nerve because third nerve is one of the most difficult entity you know to treat to make these eyes straight especially you know those with uh, congenital uh, third nerves acquired most of the time as he talked about like you know there would be kind of a partial recovery so whatever the rest of the amount we can always deal and we do have a lot of option but as he said like you know transposition of lateral rectus you have to be extremely careful on table fdt so if lr is super tight do not do lr transposition or do not split it and try to bring it will never go to the mr so that's very very important so you need to choose on table then probably you know like uh, periosteal fixation or lr recession with medial rectus you know the globe uh, as he has shown that particular surgery so i think these are the decisions which are very very important because on on a preoperative evaluation you might get tempted you know like yes there is a complete you know the medial rectus adduction limitation and probably i would choose but then there is a second check on table fdt that will take you a call for you know whether to do the lr y split and transposition second thing what i wanted to add was you know the transposition of entire lr to the mr so when there is a hypertropia you need to transpose inferiorly and when there is a hypotropia you need to transpose superiorly and while doing transposition particularly the y split i think knocking out both the obliques is very much logical being you know they are abductors so that would add some effect to your transposition and he has already mentioned like giving a fixation suture that uh, adds more adduction effect to your transposition yeah uh, thanks vivek uh, and i think uh, it was important to realize that how many modifications dr rohit highlighted during the talk based on the patient findings uh, avip sir you wanted to ask quickly or yes uh, yeah so we are uh, so if you have a paralytic squint in in one eye your surgical nomogram is more than what you would have conventionally planned for that deviation so i see essentially what i'm saying is even though we are operating the normal eye our our amount of surgery remains the same because the end effect that we require is much larger than your conventional so sometimes the thought goes that we are now operating the normal muscle so i would do the normal amount of surgery i mean like we talked about 8 mm lateral rectus or 9 mm or 12 mm lateral rectus resection recessions or uh, 9 mm medial rectus resections which are not our normal conventional nomograms for commutant surgery but if i am doing a fixation durus i'll have to do that much surgery in the normal eye because i need to get that much higher innervation to the affected muscle so normally otherwise you would have thought that i i would have i i don't do 9 mm in a normal muscle but in this case we will have to because of the creation of the fixation durus so otherwise it would not give the good effect in the affected eye uh so we have done with the third nerve now it's uh, the time for the sixth nerve so i invite dr vivek worker for his presentation on management of sixth nerve a case based approach yes so uh, i would like to thank uh, you know the scientific committee for giving me this opportunity so basically i will talk about you know how to manage the sixth cranial nerve palsy and i'll present couple of interesting cases i do not have any financial disclosure so what do we need to do when we come across a patient with six nerve palsy so we need to watch for spontaneous resolution i i think this is very very important uh, thing that we need to understand in our day to day practice for at least 6 to 9 months especially in traumatic six nerve palsies assessment of residual rectus muscle function by performing fdt and also the force duction test to identify the extraocular muscle contracture that to you know on table so having understood this basic concept when you want to deal whether you know in a surgical or you know the non surgical methods of treatment of six nerve the most important initial strategy is monocular occlusion to avoid the double vision prisms and also the botulinum toxin injection so we have these three things in our armamentarium to tackle you know the early phase of any six nerve palsy so the prisms there are two types slab of prism and you know the fresnel prism 
however most of the time you can tide over you know the uh, acute uh, uh, response of the patient to the diplopia but the most of the patients you know they are not very happy they want you know the permanent solution so over a period of time you know you can subject them to like in you know, early uh, uh, phase you know the botox injection but again there are you know pros and cons of using botox understanding you know the natural recovery of uh, uh, these uh, uh, patients with six nerve palsy so what options that we have as a surgical treatment if we have a partial six nerve as we have wait and watch and then probably we do have recession depending upon how much is you know the primary angle of deviation and how much is you know the abduction limitation we can have medial rectus recession lateral rectus resection r and r and also you know the r and r along with if the primary deviation is beyond the range of unilateral r and r you can always touch to the other eye medial rectus if there is a total six nerve palsy then we have you know the n number of surgical options from traditionally to what latest you know we are trying to do and that has been over a period of decade you know uh, a standard of care so we have different surgical procedures as you can appreciate the most commonly used in today's uh, you know the uh, world is nishida's procedure and you know the superior rectus transposition with posture suture uh, augmentation with and without medial rectus recession so that's a srt with and without medial rectus recession so if you look at the literature i think they are very much well established surgical procedure from our own country i think dr pradeep sharma and dr rohit saxena they have published extensively on you know the nishidas and you know the modification nishidas with adjustable suture for you know the uh, uh, six nerve palsy if you look at the uh, srt i think this is the first one you know bought by mendalia and group from harvard they transposed superior rectus to lr so basically we are trying to direct the vector of you know the superior rectus to the lateral rectus and that's how you know it helps to improve the abduction which got you know the paralyzed because of the lateral rectus palsy so we have our own uh, you know the experience where it, it works you know amazing so the trans srt and uh, we have seen that uh, this has also been utilized in patients treating with not only the six nerve palsy but you know the type 1 duens retraction syndrome along with uh, medial rectus recession so let's move on to the case so this lady you need to understand you know like uh, the primary evaluation is always look for systemic risk factors so this particular patient if you see that she has a very gross motility limitation with very large primary angle deviation so on evaluation she turns out to be you know the ischemic six nerve so here you need to treat the cause so control all the systemic risk factors and keep wait and watch strategy you will find that you know these patients will improve very dramatically so you can appreciate that she is almost straight in a primary gaze with complete motility uh, uh, recovery and what, what what is this case teaches that you know treatment includes strict control of ischemic risk factors nowadays as in this patient we found that you know homocysteine which is known to be you know an independent risk factor we have in house publication by dr virender how homocysteine alone can cause you know six nerve palsy and when you treat it you know there will be a complete recovery of six nerve so that we need to keep in mind to add this particular investigation as as a part of you know the systematic uh, systemic evaluation monoocular occlusion is the best way to get rid of diplopia in ischemic six nerve palsy considering you know the rapid rate of resolution of ischemic palsies most of the time this is an another case a case a child presented with a trauma so again this is a kind of you know the traumatic six nerve palsy with a gross abduction limitation there was elevation limitation for obvious region because of you know the orbital inflammatory component this child has a very large isotropia with minus 4 uh, abduction limitation again what we understand that the strategy is depending upon you know there could be an underlying other uh, uh, possible muscle injury so you need to investigate properly in terms of ordering you know the uh, ct scan or mri and to look for associated muscle entrapment having ruled out all those possibilities this particular patient was treated with a 
tapering steroid in view of you know orbital inflammation otherwise as far as sixth nerve is concerned again you know wait and watch policy for at least 5 to 6 month and then take this patient for residual amount of you know the strabismus so he had a 35 prism diopter et as a convention what we learn is do a r and r but not a normal dose you know more than normal dose especially for the paralyzed muscle and you would end up with getting you know the good primary alignment post operatively along with good uh, motility so that's how this particular patient this is an another interesting case traumatic bilateral six nerve look at the hp you know gross abduction limitation minus 6 it's not crossing even beyond the midline from the adducted position more than 70 75 prism diopter of isotropia what to do again you know the wait and watch strategy i waited for this particular patient to you know improve over a period of time as a natural uh, recovery and then there is a very large residual isotropia with motility limitation so i went ahead with uh, you know doing the uh, srt bilateral medial rectus recession along with transposition of both the superior recti to the lateral recti so i think these are the few tips for a novice strabismus surgeon who you know attempt to do this particular surgery so you can appreciate that superior rectus cautery is very very important because we know that superior recti they do have a profuse blood supply right so there are chance that they would bleed so that step is very important then once you you know isolate or separate the superior rectus you need to quite you know dissect posteriorly within the orbit so that that can be easily transposed to the lateral rectus so this is a very simple but very effective tip for the novice surgeon then again the pre placed dacron sutures now you can appreciate here i am trying to put a pre place so if you are a expert if you do more number of surgeries you would do this you know simultaneously catching both the muscles bringing and giving a scleral uh, a bite and taking the suture uh, properly but you can always keep it as a pre place so that you can do uh, in a, a very precise and systematic way as you can appreciate so this is a 60 dacron suture you can put it there and then leave this then the next step is you take this superior rectus along the spiral of two lags very close to the lateral rectus as i am taking this bite along the spiral of two lags once you do this then you have transpose the superior rectus and then you can give the uh, the 60 dacron suture passing uh, the scleral bite so that, that that's how the uh, you know the srt is being uh, performed so most of the time we end up with doing it along with uh, um, medial rectus uh, recession so you can see post operatively his ahp has completely gone there was a tremendous improvement in the uh, amount of uh, deviation in primary gaze and motility from minus 6 to minus 3 as you can appreciate here so definitely srt is a very effective procedure although it takes little more time to show its effect for at least 3 months and uh, this particular patient despite that he had had a dip diplopia so we tried to manage by doing you know the prism trials and uh, uh, you know, sometime uh, by slab of prism or by giving the phenyls prism so that's how you can manage this particular group of patient so suspected traumatic sixth nerve always look for orbital cause of motility limitation look for orbital wall fracture muscle entrapment surrounding orbital hematoma traumatic sixth nerve wait and watch for at least 6 month residual et can be corrected with r and r more than standard dose for resections extra large deviation you know bilateral srt with mr is always uh, a good option this is the last case just a similar case but a congenital onset this is a bilateral congenital six nerve palsy you can see a gross motility limitation old photographs they are since birth pretty sure on imaging we have seen that you know the lateral rectus gone into little bit kind of you know the disuse atrophy and you can appreciate that there is a bilateral thinning of uh, six nerve and then again i did a bilateral mr with srt so you see that they are in early post operative period they are straight but as you see over a period of long follow up they start to drip because srt is very powerful procedure but i have seen in my experience you know this outer drift is more common in patients with congenital six nerve palsy for obvious reason but they do have a very good outcome this particular patient for residual et i plan from probably you know the advancement of medial rectus so srt with or without mr is a very good 
procedure, it gives a good outcome. Risk of exode drift in long run should be anticipated in congenital six nerve palsies in view of poor stereopsis and you know the poor peripheral vision. And SRT is a powerful procedure and gives complete effect not less than three months. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vivek, for a wonderful presentation. He showed a variety of uh, six nerve palsy and how the management should be there. Basically, we have to individualize every case when you are managing six nerve. I just have a question about uh, injection botulinum toxin. So, when we wait and watch patients, especially trauma or the ischemic uh, variety, uh, do you follow a rule of uh, when we actually use Botox for the medial rectus? Yeah, you know, I used to use a uh, couple of years back uh, uh, Botox, but I have stopped especially in ischemic because we know the natural recovery and there is a lot of debate whether we should use it or not. Regarding traumatic, again, we are not sure, you know, what kind of trauma. Sometimes trauma looks subtle, but, you know, the palsied component, the complete palsy, if it is very severe, then even if you give the Botox, you know, it doesn't help. Uh, so, uh, in that way I would choose you know the prisms and wait and watch along with you know the monocular occlusion. Sometimes like those patients with minus six one eye involvement six nerve usually you know they learn to neglect that double vision and then we can always take a call for uh, surgical intervention. Thanks Vivek, a wonderful talk. Uh, let's move to the next talk. Uh, uh, that's by Dr. Satya Ravila. She is a professor of uh, ophthalmology, pediatric ophthalmology and strepsmology at SV Arvind Hospital, Tirupati. Uh, it's a pleasure to listen to her talks always. Over to you. She'll be speaking to us on simplifying approach to DRS. So thanks to AIOS and uh, thanks to see a fairly full hall in a squint session, though I know some of you are here for the next one, so we'll try to keep it short. Um, no financial interest to disclose and consent has been obtained from all patients. So with regards to duans, we always used to talk about as Huber's classification 1, 2, 3. But now with regards to management, it's more important to look at it in terms of is it an ESO, an EXO or an ortho in primary? What is the amount of deviation in the primary gaze? So here we have the cutoff as 20 prisms. So less than 20 prisms, doing one muscle is sufficient. When it is more than 20, we need to go for two muscles. And we also have to look at the extent of adduction, abduction limitation, and the amount of globe retractions, upshoots, downshoots, and the uh, values we get on the FDT. So as we know, in duans, it's basically a misinnervation of the lateral rectus. So when the eye is in adduction, both the MR and LR are working together, and that is why the eye goes into a globe retraction and there are overshoots. And why we have to look into this is because we also need to understand the LR co-contraction there, because this could affect even the same 4 to 5 mm of medial rectus recession could have varied results if we don't take into account the LR co-contraction. So coming to a few case examples, be it esotropia or an exotropia, if it is less than 20 uh, prism diopter in primary position, it is sufficient to do a single medial rectus. So in this patient, it looks like a very small angle, but significant face turn was there. And post 4 mm medial rectus recession, you can see her head posture being corrected. When there is a larger angle, it is important that a single MR is, or is not sufficient. So here we have to go for two muscles and we go for the contralateral muscle. So this is a patient with a 45 prism exotropia, right eye duans retraction syndrome. And you can see that this doing a single LR will not be sufficient here. So very similar to what was mentioned earlier, here we are operating on the other eye and we go for an asymmetric recession. So what we mean by creating a fixation duress is basically this LR in the normal eye is weakened. So it needs more innervation to come into this eye to even bring it to the primary position to act against a normal MR. So DRS is innovational. So here we're playing with the nerves. So according to Herring's law, this M, the other eye MR is going to get more innervation and the other eye LR is going to get less innervation. So what this also helps with is not just correcting the XT, but it also will prevent an LR contracture and a recurrence of XT. And this is why we also do it asymmetric. So in the duans eye, we cannot do too much of, already there's an abduction limitation. So we cannot do too much of LR recession here. So this is another patient on adduction. You can see she has a severe overshoot and a globe retraction. So here just weakening the LR will help for a certain amount, but not sufficiently. So in such cases, we go for what we call as the Y split. So the muscle is split. 
recessed at the desired thing and then placed about 21 millimeters apart. So this helps the muscle slipping out, which is what happens when we have the overshoots. In a very large recession, we have to, we can detach it and then attach it to the periosteum and this is done when there is no abduction because the LR is already not acting. So we can do a periosteal fixation and use the SR to help the, for the abduction. So this is the same patient where we did a right eye lateral rectus of recession of 9 mm and the LR was recessed uh, uh, in the left eye with a Y split at 7 mm. So post-operatively you can see that the primary position has improved and in adduction, though not fully corrected, there is better cosmesis. And what about abduction? So as, you, as mentioned, there is a limitation of abduction that happens but cosmetically the patient was very happy. So to improve abduction in cases where the ESO, the MR is not very tight and where patient is concerned about abduction also, we can do, earlier we spoke about doing, uh, transposing both, then it was a partial VRT and then now it was a superior rectus transposition with the MR recession. But more recently, there is a lot of hyper, hypo or torsion seen with just an SRT. So now the nishida of just move, moving the belly transfer is seen, which was also described earlier. So this is a patient with an ESO DRS and face turn and here we have done a 6 mm medial rectus recession and transposed the superior rectus to the LR and post-operatively you can see her head posture being corrected and also the abduction is improved slightly. So th in any squint and all the squints that have been discussing today, be it competent, incompetent, it's very important we spend the time on the preoperative counselling to let the parents know, to let the patient know on what to expect and always explain about a residual squint, a recurrent squint and in certain situations the chances of a postoperative diplopia. In cases of an ortho DRS, patient is happy, we don't want to touch it, except if they have significant overshoot, undershoot. So in all of these patients, multiple measurements, multiple discussions before we go for surgery. In bilateral duans, if there is fusion, best to avoid surgery. And when there is no fusion, we can go for surgery. But as has been said, there is, can be profound ramifications of the fixation duress. So you can have very unpredictable outcomes and Jampolsky has very nicely put it. The lesser the surgical indication, the greater the likelihood of post-operative complications. So in summary, in an ESO duant retraction syndrome, if it is unilateral, we can go for an MR recession or a SRT alone. If it is uh, a deviation of higher thing, we need to operate on both eyes. In, if there is an associated co-contraction, we have to do a Y split. And in a bilateral ESO DRS, again, repeat, I mean, rethink, and then when you operate, we can go for a bilateral MR recession with an SRT, very similar to the bilateral six nerve palsy case that uh, Dr. Vivek just showed us. And in XO DRS, when there is no overshoot, LR recession, when there is an overshoot, we combine it with a Y split. And when there is no abduction activation and a very gross thing, we can go for a periosteal fixation. Thank you. I just want to mention we have an orthoptic CME coming up in uh, Tirupati this month end. Thank you. Wonderful talk, Dr. Satya. I think you simplified it so much. Uh, just want to add over here about the management of overshoots uh, with more evidence coming in and more cases that we all see. We try to subclassify them into two types, innervational and mechanical. Mechanical overshoot is as you highlighted that they are managed with a Y split, that's the best procedure. If it is innervational, try to see whether inferior oblique is overacting or a superior rectus is likely pathologic, then do the weakening of those. Otherwise, uh, I think this is the most simplified approach. Okay. Uh, uh, just that uh, sometimes uh, long-standing hypertropia, particularly exo, because of the co-contractures give rise to a superior rectus contractures also adding to that. So, but invariably you are not sure whether it's mechanical or innovational preoperatively. So, you would probably do your complete uh, either anchoring of the lateral rectus to the periosteum or large with recession and a residual hypertropia may require understanding unless you can see an IO inferior oblique overaction preoperatively. So, then maybe you have to go back and do a superior rectus and often that may become the third muscle. So, that also becomes a challenge. Yeah, I just wanted to add… Uh, Can you highlight uh, and SRT. serum homocysteine levels in ischemic paralytic sevismus? <laughs> yeah. Because that lady was a very old lady and still… Uh, that's yeah. No, that yeah. particular patient had, you know, the other risk factors as well, diabetes, hypertension and homocysteine. But we have seen patients where only homocysteine is a 
risk factor. And then most of the time that homocysteine the, is the, more than 20. Uh, when the lady is 60 years, do you still consider yeah, uh, elevated can, serohomocysteine as a risk level? Patient can homocysteine yes. coexisting, like patient can yeah. have hypertension, diabetes. Uh, apart no, from can, that, it can it also… The, can the uh, elevated uh, level of homocysteine, yeah. is it still considered as a risk factor at the age of 60? Yes. Uh, yes. Is Why it not? considered? Yeah. The only thing is that you cannot say that it is causative. Because the strong studies which happened, hope to trial which happened, did not prove the association, but there were limitations of that trial. So, unfortunately, the Indian trial which was started never got completed. So that's a different thing. But uh, we can talk about in person. But but, but the younger age group, you still we it is necessary to be irrespective to of age. If hyperhomocysteinemia is there, we should try to treat. And it. then that is a risk factor not only for you know this ischemic entire body everywhere you know they can cause so obviously it would be always yeah. prudent to you know order it and get it done and if it is high we should treat it yeah. however we have seen that the younger patients with six nar palsy they do have more prevalence of having you know the higher serum homocysteine compared to elderly patients and they respond better yeah. yeah that's how they respond better we have two more talks let's continue them uh, dr swarupa is here yes madam so Dr. G. Swarupa, she will be talking to us about plus lenses versus flipper glasses in management of accommodation insufficiency in children. So, good morning everyone. Today I am going to talk about plus lenses and flipper glasses in management of accommodative insufficiency in children. Now, what is accommodative insufficiency? It is a non-strabismic binocular vision abnormality which is characterized by inability to focus for near vision. And they present as blurred vision for the near, headache, asthenopias and floating lines while doing the near work, which yeah. results in the loss of concentration and avoidance of near work, which enters the learning processes of children and young adults. Now, why it is important is because today's technological advances increase the demand of comfortable prolonged near works for all age groups, which led to the further research in the areas of this vision abnormalities. And among those, accommodative insufficiency is the most common vision abnormality, accounting for 17% of the cases. Now, uh, this is a brief introduction about the test to perform to identify accommodative abnormalities. This is a near point of accommodation which is measured by the RAF ruler and accommodative am amplitude is the strength of the accommodation which is given by the 100 divided by NPA in centimeters and this uh, Hofstetter's formula is, determines the normal value according to the age of the patient. An accommodative facility determines the flexibility of the accommodation that is to ability to stimulate and relax the accommodation and it, this is tested by the flipper glasses which has two pairs of glasses, one pair of plus glasses and one pair of minus glasses. Here a target of uh, near vision target is placed at 40 centimeters and the plus flippers are placed first when the patient says it is clear that is uh, flipped to the minus lenses and this is considered as one cycle and it is measured by number of cycles per minute. When there is difficulty in clearing the minus lenses, uh, it shows uh, that is accommodative insufficiency and there is difficulty in plus lenses that, sh that shows accommodative excess. The monocular estimate method retinoscopy, it is an accommodative response while looking at a near target. This is performed by placing a target, near vision target at 40 centimeters and performing the retinoscopy. The normal values will come up to 0.25 to plus 0.75. When it is more than 0.75, that denotes a lack of accommodation. And when it is less than 0.25, that denotes a lead of accommodation. And negative relative accommodation, it tests the relaxing ability of the accommodation. This is tested by placing uh, plus lenses at the dioptric power of 0.25 increments till the patient says it is blurred. The normal value is plus 2.5 diopters with a standard deviation of one diopter and posture relative accommodation denotes the stimulating ability of the accommodation which is tested by minus lenses. The normal value is minus 2 plus or minus one diopter. Now coming to accommodative insufficiency, how can you diagnose a case of accommodative insufficiency? When there is low accommodative amplitude that is two diopters below the half status normal value and the accommodative facility is reduced and when there is difficulty in clearing the minus lenses and when there is accommodative lag on MEM retinoscopy with value of more than 0.75 and low positive relative accommodation. Now coming to the management, foremost important thing is we have to correct the refractor error after the cycloplegic refraction followed by vision therapy. 
Now, what is vision therapy? We know that uh, blood is the stimulus for the accommodative reflex and the disparity and proximity on, of the near object is the stimulus for convergence. So, this vision therapy involves a purposeful control manipulations of the target blood disparity and proximity with the aim of normalizing the accommodation and virgin system. Now, we will discuss about uh, plus lens reading addition and flipper glasses. Coming to PLRA, how does it work? It decreases the amount of blood to some extent and this remaining blood is identified within the subject's accommodative capacity. So when the subject uh, identifies this remaining blur and he tries to clear the image, the blood driven sensors will stimulate the accommodative system and that will be normalized. Here most important thing is we should not correct the full uh, amount of accommodative insufficiency with the plus lenses. We have to keep half of, the, half of it as a reserve to stimulate the accommodative system. So how do you calculate the power of plus lenses is by dividing the difference of NRA and PRA by 2. This half amount is kept as a reserve to stimulate the accommodation. Now flipper glasses, these are two pairs of glasses, one pair of plus lenses and one pair of minus lenses. When we see through the positive side of the flipper, there is a reduction in the blur and when we see through the negative side of the flipper, there is an additional blur induced. So when we flip between these two lenses, positive and the negative lenses, there is a controlled amount of induced blur and there is a reduction in the blur. So this subject has to identify the change in the defocus and try to clear the image. By clearing the image, the accommodative system is stimulated. Now which is better, PLRA is better or uh, flippers are better? To determine this we have conducted one study which shows the efficacy of PLRA and the flipper glasses in the improvement of accommodative amplitude in cases of accommodative insufficiency. This is conducted on 50 children aged 8 to 15 years over a period of 1 year. Now all the children of the age group 8 to 15 years with the best corrected visual acuity 20 by 20 and the NPA which is worse than 10 centimeters and accommodate amplitude 2 diopters less than the normal half status formula are considered into the study. Now all the patients which have uh, amblopia, strabismus, nystagmus and prior refractive surgeries or accommodative insufficiency which is secondary to other uh, traumatic brain injuries were uh, excluded from the study. All the cases uh, we recorded the NPA, NPC and accommodative amplitude by RAF ruler and the facility is determined by the flipper glasses. Now among those 50, 25 children were allotted into the PLRA group and 25 were allotted into the flipper group and in the PLRA group we have given plus ones reading edition and we encourage the patients to read with these glasses for all the near work they have done. And we have allotted uh, one diopter flippers into the flipper group and they are instructed to do two sessions 15 minutes each. Now coming to the results in the PLRA group NPA has improved from 15 to 9 diopters with a difference of 6 diopters which is statistically significant and in the flipper group the it has improved from 16 to 8.2 with a difference of 8 diopters which is significant. And in the accommodate amplitude in the PLRA group improved from 6 to 10 diopters and in the flipper group it improved from 6 to 11 diopters which is statistically significant. This is a bar diagram showing the improvement and this is a line diagram showing the improvement in the flipper group and the PLRA group. So at the end of 12 weeks almost the values are equal in both these groups but there is a faster attainment of the normal value in the flipper group. And this is a accommodative amplitude comparison between the flippers and the uh, PLRA. Almost at the end of 12 weeks the results are same but there is a faster uh, improvement in the flipper group. Now concluding this, accommodative amplitude improves, is improved both in the flipper group and the PLRA group but there is a higher level of improvement and the faster improvement is seen in the flipper group. Although it is very difficult to motivate the patients to do all these orthoptic exercises. Thank you. Wonderful, uh, wonderful talk, Dr. Sarupa. Uh, in interest of time, maybe we'll go ahead with the next talk. Yes. But thank you. Wonderful work. Dr. Raman, uh, we invite you for the next talk on complex trabismus forms, but simple solutions. I think that's very important to provide simple solution to every complex situation. Over to you, Dr. Raman. Okay. Hello. <coughs> thank you so much for... Uh, respected chair and uh, my co-panelists. Co Thanks for the opportunity. So my talk is based on the muscle transplantation surgery. Usually uh, when we do uh, plan for a concomitant form of strabismus, especially exodeviations and exodeviations, for moderate amount of <coughs> deviations, so regular doses works very well. But when it is, when it comes for the larger deviations, more than uh, 
50, 60 prism diopters. Then there is a need to do uh, muzzle on the uh, surgery on the third muzzle or the fourth muzzle. And as uh, <coughs> Vivek was telling, so we have a very good option actually in the form of muzzle transplantation. So I am going to share my experience with unusual uh, complex uh, situations. Okay. Uh, in this procedure, we use the resected uh, muzzle piece and uh, trans uh, transplant it onto the uh, resisting uh, muzzle and that uh, resist uh, muzzle uh, length is uh, increased so that the arc of contact uh, will be maintained very well and at the same time its functionality is not compromised and it enhances the recession effect. So here uh, I can show that uh, picture and I can show the video here. This is the muzzle transplant is surgery, a snippet video. The first the lateral latest muzzle is identified here after hooking it. We use a Pfizer red band suture uh, to replace the suture onto it. And then I switch on to identify the middle latest muzzle. And uh, usually I do the painting of the muzzle surface both at the tenderness insertion point as well at the intended uh, point of resection. And two uh, double armed uh, Viking, 60 Viking sutures are used here. And we complete the resection procedure as usual. And once the resection procedure is over, then that uh, resected piece of muzzle is transplanted onto the recessing muzzle. So here uh, the recessing muzzle already we replaced Pfizer as one sutures. So that uh, suture is used to uh, suture the resected muzzle piece. So that the length is increased almost like uh, though there is 2 millimeters of shrinkage uh, but the length is appropriately increased. And in my experience there are three cases where I used a muzzle transplant as surgery to how to resolve the um, clinical dilemma. Here there is a young male, 31 year old uh, male patient. You can see here uh, right from his uh, early age, at the age of 7 years there was a thorough uh, orthotropia and at the age of 27 years there was a thorough orthotropia. But later on he started uh, complaining of uh, uh, diplopia on and off. For last one year he has been suffering with double vision and there is a huge large deviation of almost like 80 prism diopters you can see here. So after thorough orthoptic evaluation, we could found that the deviation is around uh, uh, 85 prism diopters. And you can see all the ocular, extra ocular movements are normal. And uh, added to that, he has a paradoxical diplopia. Usually an exodeviation is supposed to produce cross diplopia, but here he has uncrossed diplopia. And that is the uh, diplopia charting uh, it shows. And then uh, all other uh, parameters are normal. And this case was taken for muzzle transplantation surgery. So here I did 11 millimeters of LR uh, resection with 7 millimeters of MR resection with muzzle transplantation. So these are the pictures uh, shows here, the intra pictures. And then uh, post-operatively uh, you can notice we achieved orthotropy and patient was relieved of uh, double vision and the CSP problem also got relieved. So this was at the age of, uh, at the end of one week and at the end of six months you can see nicely in up to, uh, to date, to date also he is maintaining the ortho and uh, there is no complaints of double vision. And here is a, here is my uh, second case. This uh, gentleman had uh, the bilateral six nerve palsy ten years back. And later on, uh, two years back, again he developed bilateral six nerve palsy. And there was a recovery of uh, right now, uh, uh, right eye totally. But in the left eye, there was partial recovery. And the peculiarity of this case is that uh, there is a partial recovery with a huge deviation, almost close to 75 uh, prism diopters of deviation. And uh, the limitation of movement is minus two limitation, both in uh, levo version and levo elevation and uh, liver depression you can notice that the deviation and here there is a disproportionate uh, amount of recovery and uh, the uh, motility issue okay so this is a peculiar situation usually in a lateral latus palsy 
as we discussed earlier, R and R procedure works very well up to uh, 50 prism diopters of deviation. And even uh, modified Nishida is also doing very well. But here, uh, the situation is uh, this uh, 75 prism diopters and minus 2 limitation. Simple R and R is not going to work. So I did a muscle transplantation surgery again. So you can notice here, we achieved orthotropy and patient got relieved of double vision. And here my third case this is a case of uh, Duane's retraction syndrome in a girl. She is a nurse working at uh, Sholapur. Since uh, birth it was there. And uh, the peculiar feature here is the affected eye is the uh, left eye. But there is a secondary uh, deviation, large secondary iso deviation in the right eye. That is the contralateral eye because the right eye vision is poor. There is a compound uh, myopic astigmatism and add to that stratospheric amblyopia is added so that the deviation is almost 90 prism diopters. So here you can notice here in the left eye there is limitation of movement on all levo positions and uh, on attempted adduction there is a uh, fissure width uh, uh, narrowing and in the right eye movements are full. So this case uh, again I took up this case for the right eye correction. Okay, in the right eye uh, because it's uh, such a large deviation. Once again, I did uh, muscle transplantation surgery for this patient and it, uh, we, it, it has resulted in uh, almost near orthotropia, almost like residual uh, uh, deviation of 8 to 10 prism diopters was there. But patient was cosmetically very happy. So at the end of the discussion, I think the muscle transplantation, uh, transplantation surgery can be applied not only in the regular uh, concomitant uh, esotropias and exotropias, heavyweights and heavy syndromes, but in unusual complex situations also it can be utilized. So with this I, I conclude. Yeah. Yeah, thank you sir. I think wonderful application of the procedure. Uh, it is a very nice talk and uh, as you said, it avoids the complications of uh, doing an yeah. extra large surgery and uh, very well applied. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we have just overshot the time by five minutes. Uh, we will not uh, hold back anyone, but thank you. Thanks to all my co-speakers as well as uh, co-panelists for being here. And thanks to the wonderful uh, team of uh, all the attendees, delegates for being here in large numbers. It's very heartening to see you all. Thank you. We hand over the session to the glaucoma team, Dr. Ravindra.